This fourth generation Seat Leon looks a promising package for family hatchback segment buyers. It's still good looking and sporty to drive, but now it also gets a completely rejuvenated cabin with a whole fresh generation of screen-based media technology incorporating cutting-edge infotainment. There's also some fresh, new electrified engine options, and the car now has access to more sophisticated drive systems and additional safety tech. If you'd been overlooking this Spanish contender, it now deserves a second glance. Leon is, in the words of its maker, the lifeblood of Seat. It's one of the three core models on which the continuance of the brand depends, hence the importance of constant evolution and the need for this car, the fourth generation version. Seat, in case you didn't know, is supposed to be an emotive Latin kind of brand, a kind of Iberian Alfa Romeo. Hence the passionate marketing, the rallying success and the World Touring Car Championship trophies. Customers, though, remain a little unconvinced, especially in mainland Europe, but not so in the UK. Sales are strong on these shores and the Leon model range has always represented much of the reason why. Ever since the Mark 1 Type 1 M series version's original introduction in 1998 and subsequent second and third generation Type 1P and Type 5 F series models respectively launched in 2005 and 2012. Together with the Ibiza Super Mini, the Leon is Seat to British buyers. With over 2.2 million global Leon sales now on the board, this fourth generation version, launched in early 2020, builds upon the solid foundation established by its predecessors and, like them, has been designed and developed at Seat's base in Martorell near Barcelona. It's built there too. As with the previous models, this one is based entirely on Volkswagen Golf engineering, in this case the latest eighth generation version of that car. It's a great starting point, which explains the appeal of this Mark IV Leon with its slicker looks, increased electrification and extra rear cabin space. Plus, there's enough of an improvement in media connectivity for the Spanish maker to want to now market this as its first fully connected model. Seat has pretty much always built cars based on other people's engineering, even back in the 50s, 60s and 70s when it was repackaging Fiat's. Usually it's improved on the starting point in terms of value and affordability, and occasionally it's even produced something better. Is this one of those times? Let's find out. What if you could take everything that's good about the drive dynamics of a Volkswagen Golf, the superb ride, the excellent refinement, the exemplary at the wheel ergonomics, the smooth, efficient engines, and replicate it all in a better value package with a slightly sportier feel? Such has always been the appeal of the Seat Leon. With some of the earliest generation models, there were times when we felt such sportiness to be somewhat forced, with over-firm suspension bringing an unwelcome touch of Silverstone to the school run. But the adoption of the VW Group MQB platform for the third generation model in 2012 offered this Barcelona brand's engineers more scope to tune the ride, and we were impressed by its balance and responsive feel. Since most of the same ingredients appear here again with this Mark IV design, we didn't expect much about that to change, and it hasn't. But a few more million euros have been spent further evolving the modular Quer Borkasten platform, and the result is a really polished drive demeanor, particularly on their twisty stuff where body roll is well controlled. This is proper sportiness, complementing the agile, eager feel that's always epitomised Leon motoring in its pokier guises. Yet, even if you choose one of the more firmly specified FR models with their 15mm lower, stiffer suspension and wider tyres, which is what we have here, 
it's a dynamic recipe you'll be happy to live with in the traffic jams, urban jungles and highway mileages of real life. There's an extra dash of spirit in this car, which for some reason I just don't feel in an apparently identical Volkswagen Golf. Perhaps the sportier styling and more dynamic brand image that this set has leads you to push it that little bit harder, revealing unexpected handling talent that a Golf or this car's other Volkswagen Group cousin, the Skoda Octavia, could also offer if only given the chance. Maybe, but somehow I doubt it. Given everything said so far about this car's prioritization of drive dynamics, you'd expect it to have a decently sophisticated suspension setup, the kind of proper rear multi-link arrangement that competing brands like Kia and Hyundai have been using on all versions of their family hatchbacks for decades now, in which case you'll be disappointed. A sophisticated multi-link rear suspension package has been developed for this car, but the Spanish brand has decided that as with the previous generation design, mainstream Leon buyers won't really notice its absence. As with the Skoda Octavia, volume Leon variants developing 150 PS or less, which means uh, virtually all the engines on offer, get a cruder torsion beam arrangement that's cheaper for the Martirel factory to make and assemble. Does this rather basic approach to suspension engineering matter? You might think not. The downsides in sticking with a turn-of-the-century torsion beam arrangement only really become evident over very poor services, where the car fidgets about a bit, or if you're really throwing the car about on a country road. Both are scenarios in which the more sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setup would leave this set more composed. At the very least, SAT could have offered its DCC dynamic chassis control adaptive damping system as an option, but you can't have that either. It's worth pointing out that with the Volkswagen Golf and Audi A3 models that ride on the same MQB platform, the adoption of multi-link suspension comes in at the 150 PS output mark rather than above it, which means that all mid-range Golf and A3 petrol and diesel engines get it. We'd like to have seen the same approach adopted here. Probably say it would too. Anyway, let's get on to engines, because you're probably going to want to know about them. Sayat still thinks that a decent proportion of Leon customers are going to want a diesel, so it's completely evolved its TDI technology. That's now based around a single, much cleaner, twin-dosing 2-litre unit, which most will want in a 115 PS form that manages 62 miles an hour in 10.4 seconds en route to 125 miles an hour. If that's not fast enough, a 150 PS version of this unit is also offered. The vast majority of buyers, though, are going to prefer petrol power these days, in which case three mainstream options are available, kicking off with a 1 litre TSI Evo 3-cylinder petrol unit putting out 110 PS and able to make 62 miles an hour in 10.9 seconds en route to 122 miles an hour. Alternatively, there's a four-cylinder 1.5-litre TSI Evo power plant, which in the lower-powered 130 PS form that we're trying here improves those figures to 9.4 seconds at 130 miles an hour. This same 1.5-litre engine can also be had in 150 PS guys, which enhances those figures to 8.4 seconds and 134 miles an hour. Go for one of the FR trim levels and you can make the most of the performance on offer by adjusting your Leon's drive demeanor via the brand's drive profile selection driving mode system. This allows you to tune steering and throttle response via eco, normal and sport settings, plus there's an individual menu that will allow you to set your own parameters. The 1 litre unit and the 1.5 TSI EVO 150 PS engine can be specified with 7-speed DSG auto transmission and if you go for that you'll also get the brand's latest ETSI mild hybrid technology. Is it worth paying the rather significant extra sum say it will want from you for that kind of tech? Well the engineering certainly sounds promising. Here an integrated 48 volt BAS belt alternator starter generator powers a 12 volt main electrical setup in which a 48 volt compact lithium ion battery in the boot stores energy harvested via a Kerr's kinetic energy recovery system. Now it's easy to get terminologies mixed up here. 
like the mild hybrid tech that Ford uses, this doesn't create in this set any kind of proper full hybrid, the sort of thing that might be capable of providing Prius-like periods of electric-only driving. There's nothing like that. The set brand's overall objective instead here being to make its engines more efficient via smoother transitions between driving, cruising and resting. That additional electricity might be used either to boost the engine while accelerating or to restart it when the stop-start system kicks in at low speeds. Or this surplus energy might be directed to help power ancillary functions. As long as you limit your expectations to the things the mild hybrid tech here has actually been designed to deliver, rather than expecting eye-catching Prius-like efficiency figures, you should be pretty satisfied with the way that all this works in a DSG-equipped Leon 3 or 4-cylinder ETSI model in practice. Thanks to the electrical assistance, refinement is even better and enough battery boost is generated for the petrol engine to be rarely bothered for acceleration duties around town. Sayat also claims that the MHEV system generates a fraction more accelerative boost too, though that isn't reflected by performance figures which exactly replicate those of the manual models. But, as I've just said, the mild hybrid lower order petrol versions of this car aren't proper hybrids. If you want to lay on the E's, you'll need the PHEV model, the E-Hybrid variant. Now this features a tried and tested VW Group PHEV package used already by Seat's large Turaco family SUV and familiar since 2016 from use in Volkswagen's Golf GTE. That means a 150 PS 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine mated to a 6-speed auto DSG gearbox and an 85 kilowatt electric motor uh, now powered by a 13 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery. The WLTP rated all-electric driving range is quoted at 36 miles, which you won't get anywhere near if you explore the quoted all-electric top speed of 80 miles an hour. The Leon E-Hybrid has a total power output of 204 PS, quite a bit down on the 245 PS output of that Golf GTE model just mentioned. To get that, you'll need this plug-in package fitted to a slightly sportier Leon, the Hot Hatch Cupra PHEV variant, which as well as offering that 245 PS output, has extra pulling power with torque boosted from 350 to 400 Newton meters, though the electric driving range is hardly affected at all. The Cupra model can also come with a conventional non-electrified 2.0-litre TSI unit which puts out 245 PS in the front-driven hatch version or 310 PS as a four-wheel drive estate. All Cupra variants come with DSG paddle shift auto transmission, an electronic limited slip differential, DCC dynamic chassis control adaptive damping and fine-tuned sport suspension lowered by 25 millimetres at the front and 20 millimetres at the rear. Whatever flavour of land you happen to prefer, it'll come with the fresh generation of driver assist technology that's been ushered in by this fourth generation model. So let's finish this section by briefing you on that. Now, what's important to understand here is the switch from passive to active technology. Previously, the optional ACC Adaptive Cruise Control System merely braked and accelerated the car based around a preset speed. Now, the replacement predictive and adaptive cruise control setup uses this Leon's front camera system, GPS data and a whole host of sensors to drive the car predictively. So when ACC is set, the car knows in advance about bends, roundabouts and upcoming traffic flow. Plus this set will adapt itself to speed limits as you enter them. To get predictive and adaptive cruise control, you'll have to have bought in further up the range and pay extra for one of the safety and driving packs that you can add in to plusher FR and excellence models. These packs also include this car's clever new follow to stop setup, which on the highway, if you come across the tailback, will allow the ACC system to automatically slow you to a stop, then seamlessly start you off again. Plus, incorporated into the system is the useful traffic jam assist setup. 
introduced on the previous generation model, which can allow the car to effectively drive itself in traffic queues. Working together, predictive and adaptive cruise control and traffic jam assist can enable partially assisted so-called level two autonomous driving at anything from an urban crawl to highway speeds of up to 130 miles an hour. That's helped by the addition here of a new capacitive steering wheel, which has to sense your hands upon its rim. Otherwise, if warnings are ignored, it'll disable all the drive systems and bring the car to a gradual stop at the side of the road. We're not sure that a typical Leon customer will have quite as much use for this technology as those who will enjoy it in a comparable Golf, Octavia or Audi A3, but it's nice to have nonetheless. Those are cars that will be primarily valued by customers whose priorities in driving enjoyment lie in a lowering rather than a raising of the heartbeat. The Leon is a little different. Mainstream versions of this Spanish contender steer with a little more feel and change direction with a touch more sharpness than their Golf, Octavia or A3 counterparts. If that matters, this Iberian contender might well charm you. Even if it doesn't, there's lots here to like. Seat set out to deliver a bolder, more purposeful look for this fourth generation Leon, yet a shape clearly evolved through recognisable brand DNA. It was important for designer Alejandro Messonero Romanos and his team to get this right because visual style was apparently one of the key reasons why people bought earlier versions of this car. As before, there's a body style choice between either this five door hatch or an alternative estate. The brand's bolder intentions are certainly very evident here at the front with setback angular LED headlamps reminiscent of a Star Wars stormtrooper. The stylists have sought to create a stronger three dimensional connection between these lights and the corporate grille they flank and they've given the car a longer creased bonnet that flows into A-pillars that are more upright and sat a little further back. From the side, those familiar with the previous generation car might notice this one's 86 mm gain in length in this hatch form. It's 93 mm longer in estate guise. What's more evident though is the effort that's gone into more complex body surfacing with stronger shapes creating more shift in the light and colour tone across the sleeker body, uh, the drag coefficients being enhanced by 8%. This pickup in the rear side window graphic is neat and to suit the current zeitgeist the wheels can be big ranging from 16 to 19 inches in size. Uh, we've got 17 inch dynamic bispoke rims here. The rear is marked out by this Porsche style coast to coast full width array of rear LED tail lights, which artfully disguise this Mark IV model 16 millimeter reduction in width. The jauntily italicized Leon badge is a nice touch and there's a subtle tailgate roof spoiler, but you'd maybe hope for a touch more sportiness from this supposedly more dynamic FR variant. As usual though, what's more important is what you can't see the supremely flexible MQB modular transverse matrix chassis that was introduced with this model's predecessor and which has underpinned countless VW Group models since the Mark 7 model Golfs first introduced it back in 2012. In this form it now features added rigidity and a stiffer hot formed steel and aluminium structure. So, evolution characterises the outside, and there's a bit of Latin character too, which will be reflected as you move to get in at night by the way that opening the doors sees the puddle light spelling out hola on the ground. How much of this kind of progressive, characterful approach will be evident in the cabin? Quite a lot is the answer. It's certainly a lot more sophisticated inside than before. This car, like its VW Group cousins, having gained a major dose of advanced screen technology, here housed in more angular, chiselled fascia design. 
Sayat has attempted to differentiate the cabin with hexagon-shaped vents and panels, trendy italic instrument fonts and decorative mouldings that surround the dashboard and continue through into the doors. There's also a bit more of a premium feel this time round, the way that the window ledges and the leading edge of the dash together form an unbroken crescent is almost Jaguar-like. And on a sporty FR model like this one, the ambience is lifted by red stitching on the steering wheel, the gear shift gator and the seats. The screens have swept away many of the previous switches and buttons. There are no physical ventilation controls now, for instance. And as before, you sit a fraction lower than the class norm. Assuming you avoid entry-level SE trim, which gets analog instrument dials and a conventional 8.25-inch media system centre screen, you'll be served up the electrical fest that is the SAT digital cockpit, a fancy way of describing that this central display is of the big 10-inch kind and that instrument binnacle dials have been replaced by a 10.25-inch screen. Some elements of this whole combined layout really work. Things like the smart graphics, the nice haptic clicks when you press screen options and so on. And some really don't, like the awkward slider controls for volume and temperature beneath this central display. Still, you can activate these features in other ways, and pushing cabin design boundaries doesn't come without a degree of risk. Pretty much all the infotainment stuff you could need is on this centre stack media system plus with navigation screen. Things like navigation, radio, telephone, vehicle data and the smartphone mirroring Apple CarPlay and Android Auto features of SAT's full link connectivity system. Uh, though the icons for all these things aren't particularly touch sensitive. There's an element of gesture recognition and a built-in eSIM that enables you to create a Wi-Fi hotspot and enjoy online connectivity, which allows you to receive traffic information, access online radio and benefit from over-the-air system updates. And you can hold and drag display icons to move them around, or you can select a split screen that will enable you to, for instance, display navigation, audio and phone settings all at the same time, with a diagonal graphic supposedly inspired by the Diagonal Avenue street layout in Barcelona. There's also an online shop that will allow you to upgrade certain elements of the car's technology after you bought it using over-the-air updates that'll allow SEAT to potentially improve the screen's functionality over time too. I wasn't quite so pleased to find this Media System Plus monitor also burdened with the task of climate control. Once you locate the ventilation screen options, they work fine, unlike those temperature slider controls I mentioned earlier. And there's a particularly neat layout, which gives you shortcut options for frequent climate needs. Uh, things like warm my hands, cool my feet, defog the windows, warm my feet, and fresh air. And there's an air care climber section that allows you to select the option to filter fine dust and pollen out of the air inside the vehicle. But you have to take your eyes off the road for too long to find all this, even if you use the provided shortcut options at the top of the display. In an Audi A3, which has fundamentally the same cabin architecture, you get a row of separate physical climate controls beneath these central vents, and this Leon would benefit from that too. Now, it does at least help in this regard, though, that climate is one of the many things that you can control via SEAT's latest voice control system, activated by prefacing what you want with hola, hola. What would you like to do? which you might feel a bit self-conscious saying in front of your passengers. Clever digital microphones are able to ensure clear voice recognition and also locate the person who's speaking, either the driver or the front passenger. So if the front passenger asks for the heated seat to be switched on, for instance, the system will recognize the identity of the questioner and only activate the front passenger's heated seat. Neat. Anything this centre screen can't tell you, and much that it can, will be covered off by that 10.25 inch configurable driver instrument cluster I mentioned earlier, there to replace the usual dials and gauges in the instrument binnacle.
It's based on Audi's virtual cockpit technology and offers lots of customizable options, starting with the choices offered by this steering wheel view button. Now this enables you to choose either a fairly conventional layout, twin virtual dials with a central information section, or a more open screen with a digital speed readout below, this alternative layout reprising Sayat's diagonally split design theme. Either way, you can highlight the left, the right, or the center of the screen using this steering wheel button and tailor what you want to see in each area using the little rotary controller nearby. The right-hand side can display audio, phone, compass, or nav info, while on the left, you can select from range, MPG, fuel level, temperatures, average speed, trip data, and drive assist info. The center part of this monitor can show features more graphically, or a nav map can be selected, which can also display full screen. When you power off, Usefully, the screen reverts to a trip summary, giving you driving time, distance travelled, consumption and average speed. Enough with screens and digitalization. What else do you need to know here? Well, there are a few signs of, how shall I put it, cost management. The rather low rent door pulls and the absence of the flock line door bin bases that you get in a Golf to stop your keys from sliding about. But build quality seems strong and the ergonomics are generally difficult to fault. Plus the seats, which pleasingly come with standard lumbar adjustment, are supportive and look great when in this FR trim they're upholstered in this hexagonally indented grey fabric with that lava red stitching I mentioned earlier. DSG Auto Gearbox models now get a smaller Porsche style shift by wire stubby lever that's almost like an electric switch which frees up space on the centre console for extra stowage. On the subject of storage there's a big glove box and decently sized door bins with angled interior sections which can hold a 500 milliliter bottle of water plus you get a lidded bin between the seats with an incorporated 12 volt port, a ticket clip in the sun visor and there are the usual twin cup holders below the gear lever. You'll find more connectivity points, twin USB ports, above this large open area at the base of the centre stack, though unfortunately these sockets are both of the smaller USB-C type, so depending on your device you might need an unsightly converter lead. So it's forgotten an overhead compartment for your sunglasses too. Still, for every tiny foible, there are two or three other features you'll probably really like. Maybe the central armrest that on FR models and above tops that bin between the seats and adjusts for five stages of height. The way that the pedals align perfectly with the steering wheel. Or perhaps just the way that the gearbox lever is just the right height to sit comfortably in your hand. And it's neat the way that in the background lighting part of the centre screen's car section you can set the brightness for different parts of the front of the cabin, the mid fascia, the footwell and the door cards. What else? Uh, well, the slim A-pillars mean good forward vision, but over the shoulder vision isn't quite as good. The large C-pillars rather get in the way, so it's just as well that rear parking sensors are standard fit. Let's take a seat in the back. The Leon is a slightly longer car than its Golf cousin, and that, along with this Mark IV model's 50mm wheelbase increase, leads you to hope for a touch more rear legroom. Which, by and large, is what you get. An extra 49mm of rear seat legroom, meaning that a pair of six-foot adults could be accommodated here in reasonable comfort, providing front seat occupants don't slide their seats fully back. There's certainly a little more space here than there would be in premium badged family hatches like the BMW 1 Series or the Mercedes A-Class. In a comparable Skoda Octavia, though, you'd get loads more room. As we said with the previous generation model, we're disappointed that the height of this centre transmission tunnel makes it so difficult for middle seat passengers to be comfortably accommodated. Two people should be quite happy though, and they'll benefit from the extra light of these rear quarter windows, from twin beamed overhead reading lamps, and this fold down centre armrest with its twin cup holders. 
Sit back pockets are provided and the door cards with their angular handles incorporate decently sized bins. There are twin USB ports, though again they're of the smaller USB-C variety. And if you avoid the SE spec models, you'll get three zone climate control, which means that rear passengers will gain these separate controls for these twin central vents. Let's finish this segment by taking a look in the boot. The catch for which, as usual, is activated by pushing this centre tailgate badge. Your salesperson may well be keen to reference the fact that the 380 litre space provided here, exactly as before and the same as a Golf, is around 40 litres more than you'd get in a rival Ford Focus. They're less likely to point out though that this Leon's capacity is still significantly down on what you'd find in segment rivals like Skoda's Octavia, Honda Civic and Peugeot's 308. And they might also neglect to mention that if you happen to choose the Leon e-hybrid PHEV model, cargo capacity falls massively to just 270 litres. Assuming you stay with a conventionally engined variant like this one, once you get beyond this rather high loading lip, you'll find the space on offer to be pretty usable and a push chair or a baby buggy would easily fit, or even a set of golf clubs spread widthwise if you take out this neat lift out divider panel in the left hand corner. Disappointingly though, uh, you can't have the adjustable height boot floor that's standard on a golf, even as an option. Still, this is a pretty flexible area thanks to twin bag hooks, no fewer than six tie down points and a central ski hatch in the seat back so that longer items can be slid through between a couple of rear seated passengers. There's a bit more space under the cargo base though only because Seat neglects to include any sort of space saver spare wheel as standard. Pushing forward the conventional 60-40 split rear bench frees up 1,210 litres across a load area that's virtually flat with the seats folded. If you do need lots of regular cargo versatility, you'll obviously be better off choosing the Leon Estate body style. That offers a 620 litre boot, that's 30 litres more than the previous generation version, extendable to 1,470 litres with the seats folded. Pricing is pretty much par for the course in the family hatchback segment, which meant that at the time of this test in autumn 2020, customers could expect to pay somewhere in the 20,000 to 30,000 pound bracket for mainstream versions, with diesels starting from around 23,000 pounds and most volume variants of either fuel type priced below 24,000 pounds. If you want to progress from this five door hatch body style and get yourself the more practical estate variant, there's a premium of around a thousand pounds to pay. Either way, virtually all sales are made with either base SE trim, SE dynamic spec, or the FR variant that we have here. For those wanting a bit more engine tech, the PHEV Leon E hybrid was launched at asking prices from around 31,000 pounds. For the top Cupra Leon hot hatch, you'll be looking at more like £35,000. Engine wise, the recipe for mainstream hatch models is pretty simple. Either a 2 litre TDI diesel option with either 115 PS or 150 PS, or the choice of either a 3 cylinder 1 litre 110 PS TSI Evo petrol unit, or the 4 cylinder 1.5 litre TSI Evo petrol variant that we have here, offered with either 130 or 150 PS. The alternative estate body style does without the base 1 litre petrol unit, but otherwise has pretty much the same power plant range. Now, bear in mind that with either body shape, say it's much trumpeted mild hybrid engine tech only features with TSI petrol power, and then only if you order either the 110 PS 1 litre unit or the gutsier 150 PS version of the 1.5 litre engine with 7 speed DSG auto transmission. This explains why with these power plants the premium to go from a manual gearbox to an automatic is well over £2,000. Onto the value proposition. 
Before we start to look at other manufacturer offerings in this segment, it's worth pointing out that this Leon is one of three similarly sized hatch models now offered in the Seat range, but the other two cost quite a lot more. The most obvious alternative if you want a car of this size from the Spanish maker is this Iberian Mark successful Attica mid-sized SUV. But that costs three to four thousand pounds more with comparable engines and spec. And of course, you'll pay much more, think well over thirty thousand pounds for the Cupra Elborn, the Barcelona brand's Nissan Leaf-sized compact full EV. So, if you're looking for Leon alternatives, it's likely that you'll be looking at conventional family hatchbacks from other volume makers. Now, the natural starting point here is to compare this Leon against the three VW Group products that share its platform and its basic engineering, uh, namely the Skoda Octavia, the Volkswagen Golf, and the Audi A3. Now, a Leon costs fractionally less than an Octavia in its various base petrol and diesel engines, uh, though bear in mind that the uprated 150 PS version of the 1.5 litre TSI petrol unit is only offered with plusher Leon trim levels, so asking prices for that power plant start quite a lot higher than you'll pay in the Octavia lineup, where that unit is available right across the range. As for the Audi and the Golf, well, surprisingly, it's the A3 that's closer in price to this set, costing around £2,500 more, like for like. For a comparable Golf, you'd be looking at around £3,500 more. Uh, you've really got to want the Volkswagen badge to pay that. You'll also want to be briefed on the way that other volume family hatchbacks stack up against this Seat's pricing. In terms of the popular models in the segment you'll probably be considering, Vauxhall's Astra is your cheapest option. It could save you around £1,500 over a comparable Leon, but feels quite a lot cheaper inside, and there's fractionally less rear seat space than you'd get in this Seat. A comment that also applies to a Ford Focus, a model comparably priced against this Seat in base diesel form, but which costs more with a mainstream petrol engine, around £1,000 to £2,000 more, depending on the one you're looking at. What about other popular alternative class options? You get a bigger boot with either a Honda Civic, which costs about the same as a Leon, or a Peugeot 308, which costs a fraction more. But arguably with those two cars, a less advanced cabin. And you might want to know that you could potentially save uh, around a couple of thousand by choosing either a Kia Seed or a high-end i30. A Renault Megane costs around the same as a Leon, and a Mazda 3 or a Mini Clubman will cost you a fraction more. A Toyota Corolla will cost quite a lot more, though that's because it only comes with a full hybrid engine. So that's talked you through your class alternatives. If, having considered them, you conclude, as quite a few customers will, that there's nothing quite like this Seat in this segment, your mind might be made up by a bit of generosity on the Spanish brand's part when it comes to standard spec. Is that what's being delivered here? Let's see. All Leons now come with full LED headlights and LED tail lamps while base SE models get 16-inch alloy wheels, LED fog lights, uh, rear parking sensors, auto headlamps and wipers, an alarm, metallic paint, and a range of camera safety features we'll come to in a moment. Inside with base SE spec, you get air conditioning, cruise control with a speed limiter, a Kessie Go keyless start button, lumbar adjustment for the front seats, and an 8.25-inch media system central infotainment screen incorporating the brand's full-link Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration with Bluetooth. Uh, there's also two USB-C ports and a seven-speaker DAB audio system. Probably the main reason you'd upgrade your Leon to the next trim level up, SE Dynamic, is to get the brand's digital cockpit cabin screen set up, which is standard across the rest of the range and pairs a larger 10-inch center dash media system plus with navigation screen with a 10.25-inch digital driver binnacle display. The Media System Plus screen incorporates 3D navigation, voice, con 
control and online connectivity with an embedded eSIM, which means that the car will never lose its connection with the digital world and allows users access to the latest infotainment apps and over-the-air updates. Online connectivity also uses cloud-based real-time traffic information to embellish the navigation system and can allow you to access online radio so that you can listen to stations from all around the world. Other additional SE dynamic features include dark tinted rear windows, larger 17 inch dynamic tri-spoke alloy wheels and a park assist system that'll steer you into spaces using all round sensors. The next stage in the range is the sporty FR spec that many customers want, which is what we're trying here. Visually, FR variants are set apart by bespoke bumpers, unique 17-inch dynamic bispoke alloy wheels, and different LED headlights that have separate incorporated daytime running light strips and dynamic scrolling indicators. Other FR spec features include power folding mirrors, auto wipers, and sport suspension lowered by 15 millimeters. Plus, inside with FR trim, you can expect to find the SEAT Drive Profile Selection Driving Mode system that allows you to alter steering feel, throttle response, and on DSG Auto models, gear shift timings via your choice of normal, sport, and eco drive settings. FR trim also gives you a wireless phone charger, three zone climate control, illuminated front door sills, an auto dimming rear view mirror, a front center armrest, and ambient lighting. If you want to go further, then choose between the luxury of plush excellence spec or the sportiness of FR Sport trim. Both get you a leather heated steering wheel, micro suede upholstery, heated front seats and a powered driver's seat. You can build on that either with Kessie Advanced Keyless Entry and a rear view camera, that's with excellent spec, or with larger 18 inch performance machined alloy wheels and interior wraparound lighting that gives the cabin an unbroken arc of light wrapped around the entire width of the dashboard, uh, continuing on into the doors. That's all with FR Sport spec. At the very top of the range is the flagship Excellence Lux trim level, which also gets that interior wraparound lighting package, along with leather upholstery, 18-inch aerodynamic performance alloy wheels, and the various camera safety and semi-autonomous driving features in SEAT's safety and driving pack. That only leaves the Leon variant that isn't badged as a SEAT, the Cupra Leon. This hot hatch has a more menacing look than mainstream models thanks to a large open air dam up front, plus there are copper colored brake calipers, copper trimmed tailpipes either side of a deep rear diffuser and a lowered ride height with DCC adaptive damping. There's copper colored cabin trimming, uh, a start button on the sport steering wheel, a special Cupra driving mode and an extra sport setting for the 12.3 inch digital instrument panel with a prominent central rev counter. The Cupra Leon comes in a couple of unique matte paint finishes and there's a choice of 18 or 19 inch alloy wheels finished in silver, black or a copper black mix plus those semi-autonomous safety and driving pack driving features also come included. Enough with trim levels, let's talk media connectivity across the range. So it promotes this car as its first fully connected vehicle, and it's not an empty claim. For a start, whatever kind of layout you choose, standard across the range is use of this Spanish brand's clever, freely downloadable Seat Connect app. With remote access, a year's use of which comes with a car, this allows you to remotely lock or unlock your layout from wherever you are. If you've forgotten where you parked it, it'll give you area notification. And if, having got that, you still can't find your car in a crowded car park, the Connect app will allow you to remotely activate either the alarm, the headlights or the horn. It'll also give you a vehicle health report, help you schedule servicing and give you various elements of extra driving data. Plus, the app can tell you if someone using your Leon is driving at faster than a preset speed, and it can alert you if the car is ever stolen. 
avoid base SE trim and this app has various online features. You can use it for traffic information, route calculation and info on local parking spaces and fuel stations. With PHEV plug-in hybrid variants, uh, SEAT Connect will allow you to remotely manage battery charging and climate preconditioning too. Another clever new standard integrated feature is Carter X, a system which communicates wirelessly with other Carter X enabled vehicles using cloud-based Wi-Fi technology so as to share information and brief your Leon's electronic systems automatically on traffic updates. So, for instance, your Leon can receive advanced warning of impending roadworks, accidents and emergency vehicles. It can also detect when other cars with the system are performing panic braking in front of you and in such an emergency will turn on your own brake lights even before you've reacted to help avoid you being rear-ended. And in certain continental European cities, Carto X can communicate with the urban traffic light system so as to learn the real-time status of light activation. Now this means that your arrival at the traffic lights can be timed to the point where it's about to turn green. On to options across the land range. There aren't many. As mentioned earlier, you don't even have to pay extra for metallic paint. We've got magnetic grey here. You can add a panoramic glass sunroof and with FR and Excellence trim you can have interior wraparound lighting too. In terms of practicalities, remember that you'll need to budget more for a space saver spare wheel and jack. You can add in tow bar pre-installation as well. Enough with options. SEAT reckons that this is the safest model it's ever built, so let's take a look at driver assist systems and safety provision. Now, you'd expect some sort of autonomous braking system on a car of this kind these days. Uh, SEAT is called Front Assist, and as usual with these sorts of setups, it scans the road ahead as you drive. If a potential collision hazard is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. For this Mark IV Leon model, this setup's city emergency braking system has been enhanced with predictive pedestrian and cyclist protection which is more specifically able to identify people or cyclists who might be about to inadvertently step into your path. Every Leon also gets a tiredness recognition system that continually monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness and will, if necessary, prompt you to stop for a restorative coffee. And every lane also gets a lane keeping system that warns you when you stray out of your lane and applies gentle steering assistance to ease you back into it. In our experience, the lane keeping system can be a bit intrusive, helping when it isn't required and resetting itself on each trip so that if you don't like it, you have to keep turning the thing off. Anyway, all of this is in addition to all the more usual features that come fitted across the Leon range, which have helped to justify this car's five-star Euro NCAP safety test showing. There's twin front, side and curtain airbags, though disappointingly you don't also get an extra one to protect the driver's knees. There are, of course, Isofix child seat fastenings on the rear bench. Uh, we also like the inclusion of a multi-collision brake system that recognises when an impact has occurred and brakes the car to prevent it being uncontrollably propelled into oncoming traffic. It's also worth mentioning that, like all current new cars, this one has an emergency call equal SOS system that, in the event of an accident where the airbags are triggered, will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location. Other conventional safety features include ASR traction control and an improved ESC stability control system plus MSR engine braking control that will stop you skidding if you change down abruptly on a slippery surface. 
If you do get into a skid, a DSR steering assistance feature will help you steer out of it and you get an ABS braking system further assisted by brake control, which works via the ESC stability system and a brake booster and helps to reduce stopping time when you really slam on all the anchors in an emergency, at which point the hazard lights will automatically flash. Plus, all layouts get a hill hold function to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions, plus tyre pressure monitoring. That's the extent of the standard safety kits you get across the range, but plenty more can be added in if you're prepared to pay extra. Incidentally, you don't necessarily have to make all the decisions on this at the time of purchase. The infotainment system's latest over-the-air functionality means that certain items will be available to update your layout at a later date, should you decide that you need them. Uh, features like those, for instance, in the various safety and driving packs that you can pay extra for with FR, FR Sport or Excellence trim and enjoy a standard with top Excellence Lux spec. The safety and driving packs all include a feature that Seat's particularly pleased with. It's Predictive Adaptive Cruise Control System. This uses GPS data feeds delivered from the navigation system and inputs from dynamic road sign display and the front mounted camera to proactively amend your land's cruise speed depending on the layout ahead, bends, roundabouts, junctions, changes in speed limits and built up areas. This reduces the requirement for driver input and mitigates against sudden speed changes and manoeuvres. The three available safety and driving packs embellish this predictive adaptive cruise control setup in various ways. The base M pack includes dynamic road sign display and auto high beam assist. Uh, to all that, the mid-range L spec safety and driving pack also includes three extra features. Side assist, which alerts you if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Exit assist, which alerts you of oncoming traffic when you're reversing out of a space. And exit warning, which alerts you if you're just about to open one of the doors in the face of oncoming traffic. Now, finally, if you want all the camera safety kit this Leon is capable of providing, you'll want the top XL spec safety and driving pack, which includes uh, everything I've talked about to date, plus an emergency assist system. Here, if the vehicle senses that the driver has taken his or her hands off the wheel for more than 15 seconds, as might happen if, for instance, you were taken ill, then audible and visual warnings will be given before a braking jolt. If the driver continues to fail to respond, then the Leon will be brought to a controlled stop. It's all very reassuring. Lots about this fourth generation Leon is different this time round, but at first glance you might conclude that the engine range hasn't changed too much and that therefore the efficiency proposition on offer here will be much the same. Well, yes and no. Let's explain. This Mark IV model launched, as newly designed Leon generations tend to do, with broadly the same mainstream power plants so it was offering to customers in older versions of the previous model. Of course, they've been fully updated to the latest Euro 6 D10 emission standard. Now, before we delve down a little into the Barcelona brand's engine technology here, let's begin with delivering you the WLTP rated stats that you'll need for the conventional volume variants you're most likely to choose. For petrol people, both the entry level units, the 110 PS 3 cylinder 1 litre TSI Evo and the 130 PS 4 cylinder 1.5 litre TSI Evo unit we're trying here, deliver almost identical returns with manual transmission. Uh, that's up to 52.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and around 124 grams per kilometre of CO2 which, to give you some class perspective, is very similar to the kind of readings that you get from directly equivalent versions of main competitors. If you want the 1.5 litre TSI petrol engine in uprated 150 PS form with a manual gearbox, it'll do a little worse than that because this power plant can only be had 
with the plusher FR and excellence trim levels that get larger 17 or 18 inch wheels. Think up to 48.7 miles to the gallon and 132 grams per kilometre. A diesel would do better of course in terms of CO2 and MPG anyway, especially one of the diesels freshly fitted to this Mark IV Leon. Think black pump fueled engines are past it? Well take a look at the TDI units used here which are now both of 2 litres in size. The detuned 115 PS version of this new 2 litre TDI unit, which has replaced the previous 1.6 litre TDI power plant, manages up to 67.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 111 grams per kilometre of CO2 with the 16 inch wheels you get with base SE trim. Obviously for the alternative 2 litre TDI 150 PS variant you'll need to budget for a little more efficiency spend. Think around 60 miles to the gallon and closer to 120 grams per kilometre of CO2, which by the way is better than you'd get from an equivalent Ford Focus 2 litre EcoBlue 150 PS model. These excellent figures have been aided by the introduction of so-called twin dosing catalytic converter technology, which features dual AdBlue injection, significantly increasing emissions cleanliness. With twin dosing, AdBlue is injected upstream of two SCR catalytic converters arranged in series, with the result of cutting emissions of nitrogen oxide by up to 80% compared with the previous 2 litre TDI engine. All well and good, but what about the electrified and eco-minded engine technology the industry's crying out for right now? Say it had full access to latest VW Group technology in order to deliver that, and the result is a bit of a toe in the water here. The brand's latest ETSI 48 volt mild hybrid technology only comes if you choose either the 1 litre TSI EVO variant or the 1.5 litre TSI EVO 150 PS model with DSG auto transmission. If that's not enough battery tech for you, there's a full hybrid plug-in derivative offered further up the range. We'll start with the ETSI tech which it's claimed can improve your economy by up to 17%. The actual quoted WLTP figures don't fully reflect that, suggesting that a 1 litre ETSI EVO DSG Auto model can manage up to 51.4 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 124 grams per kilometre of CO2. For the 1.5 litre ETSI EVO DSG Auto 150 PS model, the figures are up to 48.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 133 grams per kilometre of CO2. Now, in case you didn't catch our brief resume of the mild hybrid tech in our driving experience section, it's worth quickly briefing you that a Leon E TSI isn't any kind of Prius-like full hybrid. It can never run independently on electric power alone. Instead, the mild hybrid system is merely there to help recuperate energy, add a little acceleration boost and power the stop-start system, which is probably where you'll notice it most. The start-stop range begins at just under 14 miles an hour, so you'll often find an ETSI engine Leon coasting up to the end of a traffic queue, a traffic light or a level crossing. As with Ford's mild hybrid engines, this Volkswagen Group setup which also features on rival Volkswagen Golfs, uh, Skoda Octavias and Audi A3s is based around an integrated 48 volt BAS belt alternator starter generator. This powers a 12 volt main electrical setup in which a 48 volt compact lithium ion battery in the boot stores energy harvested via a Kurs kinetic energy recovery system. If you'd prefer a full hybrid with proper all-electric capability, your dealer will refer you to one of the plug-in Leon variants. These use the same 1.4 litre TSI petrol engine and 6-speed DSG Auto gearbox package as features in the larger Turaco e-hybrid and as with that car, the 13 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery that drives the PHEV drivetrain's 85 kilowatt electric motor is bigger than the class norm. 
that facilitates a very decent WLTP all-electric driving range rated at up to 36 miles for either the base 204 PS Leon e-hybrid or the sportier 245 PS Cupra Leon PHEV. Either way, if this Leon will only be used for short commutes and recharged regularly overnight, it's conceivable that a Leon PHEV could be run almost entirely without fuel. And conceivably, if you get your charging regime right, on off-peak electricity that'll hopefully cost pennies rather than pounds to consume. The combined range of the petrol and electric motor is around 660 miles, making a plug-in layout an ideal comfortable car for the really long journeys that would probably defeat full EVs like, say, a Nissan Leaf or, say, its own Elborn EV. And it'll charge much quicker than a full EV. Powering a PHEV layout up from a domestic socket would take around five hours, but using a garage wall box, you'll be able to reduce your charging time period to around three and a half hours. The charging connector is located beneath a cap in the front of the front left door. The quoted WLTP combined cycle fuel return for a Leon e-hybrid is up to 235.4 miles to the gallon. And the CO2 reading that'll see your BIK tax payments rated at just 10% is an impressive 27 to 30 grams per kilometer. To give you some perspective, the one liter TSI Evo petrol model has a BIK rating of 27%, while the 115 PS two liter TDI diesel is rated at 29%. What else? Well, whichever Leon variant you select, you can monitor its ongoing frugality via selectable consumption readouts on the left-hand side of the digital instrument binnacle screen. Servicing? Well, as usual with SAT models, you're looking at, at a garage visit every 10,000 miles or every 12 months, whichever comes sooner. At point of purchase, you can opt for a two-year prepaid servicing plan with monthly payments that at the time of this test in autumn 2020 were affordably pitched at £16.59. pence. What else? Uh, well we like the fact that misfueling protection is standard across the range so you won't be able to accidentally put petrol in your diesel Leon or vice versa. Less impressive is the three year 60,000 mile warranty cover. Uh, we can't see why Sayat couldn't extend that mileage limit to 100,000 miles since that's what you get on mechanically very similar Volkswagen vans. Doing that though wouldn't give Sayat dealers so much of an opportunity to sell extended warranty packages. The paintwork warranty lasts for three years and as you'd expect this car is protected by a 12 year anti-corrosion package. The Leon e-hybrid has a separate eight-year battery warranty, which also covers the battery for up to 100,000 miles. What about residual values? Well, if you choose a mainstream model and don't go mad with the extras, experts predict that after three years and 36,000 miles, you should be able to get 41 to 42% of your original purchase price back. A decent return on investment uh, for a volume branded car in this class. Insurance groupings for mainstream Leon variants tend to be a notch above those for a Golf. They start at 15E for the 1 litre TSI Evo. Think 18E or 19E for the 1.5 TSI 130 PS model. It's 22E for the 1.5 TSI 150 PS manual version. And 22E or 23E for the 1.5 E TSI DSG auto variant. For the 2 litre TDI 115 PS diesel, it's 19E. This Leon has long been a strong but often overlooked contender in the family hatchback segment, and it's been usefully improved in this fourth generation guise. Buyers will appreciate the big leap forward in technology and quality, particularly the smarter safety and improved media connectivity. And the mild hybrid and plug-in engine tech brings the range right up to date. Whether there really is Latin spirit in every one is another question, of course. In the case of sportier versions like the FR models, we'd be tempted to say yes. True, this Leon could be more exciting in its more affordable forms, and it's no longer one of the cheapest options you could choose in this segment. 
Still, Sayat's argument in response is that this is now one of the most technologically advanced cars of its kind. There's some truth in that. As before though, most of the really clever features are optional and you have to progress quite a long way up the range before this car begins to feel really luxurious. We also can't help feeling that this car has a little less of its own identity this time round. Still, you might well feel that drawing more deeply from the paragon of engineering excellence that is Volkswagen's Golf can hardly be a bad thing, and you'd have a point. Overall, on a pure value versus quality basis, this Leon has long been the pick of the Volkswagen Group offerings in this sector. And that also makes it one of the key segment benchmarks outside the Wolfsburg family of brands, which in turn makes it a very good car indeed.